In this video, we are going to consider maps and plans and also some scale work. So I'm sure you're all familiar with um, Table by Mall and here is the shopping mall layout. Now, what could happen is we could ask you this in a testing exam and it's almost like you are investigating this map um, when we ask you questions. So, for example, we can ask you, how would you know that there is more than one level to this mall? And you can see that by looking at the stairs and the escalators that there are. I can also ask you where in the mall are the escalators situated. And then you can say that there are opposite entrance one, there are opposite entrance two, and there are opposite entrance three. Uh, we can also ask you where the bathrooms are allocated. Now, even if you've been to this mall, don't just say that you know that the bathrooms are on the bottom level. On this level, there are bathrooms right over here. Um, and it's between shops G090 and G084. Okay, so you will have to explain where you can find the bathrooms. Um, other questions that could be asked are how to, if you are parked at entrance 2, how would you get to the checkers? So you will have to give some directions. So walking in um, at entrance 2, you will have Mythos on your right. Um, keep walking until you get to the middle section of the the mall where you have almost like an intersection and then you will turn right and walk towards the checkers. So really imagine that you are on this floor plan and that is how you will give directions to where you need to go. So this is basically um, shopping malls in a nutshell. You will just have to investigate what is going on on the map that was given to you and make um, and answer questions accordingly. Also, read all the little fine prints here. So, for example, you can see that that is Standard Bank, that is APSA, that is F&B, and that is Ned Bank. Um, so, you can see that they are all on the outside of the mall, while these rest of the shops are all on the inside of the mall. You might also know this, that um, the Virgin Active is on the outside, and there's parking bays there in front of the Virgin Active. Okay. Yeah. So let's go on to a different type of layout. Here we have a house plan. Um, and just like with the shopping mall layout, you will have to answer certain questions about it. So firstly, whenever you see a staircase on a house plan, you know that it has more than one level. Just like we saw in the shopping mall, this one also have, has more than one level. The fact that this house plan has a balcony over here tells me that this is not the ground floor. Also, if you look carefully here, you will see that it's mostly bedrooms. He has a master suite, which means the master bedroom. Um, there's bedroom two, bedroom three, bedroom four, a bathroom, another bathroom, and this is like an activity lounge or something. Um, they call the cupboards in this place, uh, in, on this house plan, a robe. So when you see W-I-R, it means walk in robe or walk in cupboard. So they could also have said cupboard and walk in cupboard. WC as does not stand for Western Cape. It stands for water closet. Um, so in this little closet or cupboard is the toilet. So water closet is just a nicer way of saying um, the toilet. And it is separate from the bathroom in this case. Here you also see that the, the toilet is separate from the bathroom and they call it a water closet. En suite means that the bathroom is connected to the master suite, while this bathroom is not connected to a bedroom. Um, there are also measurements on this house plan, and we see here it's 3,66 by 4. And now you might think, what are the measurements for this? So often the measurements are indicated in millimeters on here, but obviously that cannot be 3 millimeters. It's also not three centimeters because that's very small. Three kilometers would be too big. So logically, we can reason that this is 3.66 meters by four meters. If you measured that the side length over here is four centimeters for that four meters, we can write a scale. So the scale here is... Four centimeters 
represents 4 meters. But remember that this is not your simplified scale. There are two problems here. Firstly, it is not simplified. And secondly, they are not in the same unit. So looking here, this is centimeters and this is meters. We will both have to make them the same. So take them to the smallest unit. So just to remind yourself, make them into the same unit. I know that there are 100 centimeters in a meter. Therefore, I will have to multiply the meters by 100 which will give me 4 centimeters to 400 centimeters, noting that the unit is the same in both of them. So further to this, and after our first step of making them the same unit, our second step would be to simplify. So in this case, you can use your fraction button on your calculator to simplify 4 over 400, and you will get 1 over 100, or you can just see that Four goes into both of these numbers which will simplify to 1 to 100. In a simplified scale you always have 1 to something and this 1 and the 100 or the whatever number is next to it does not necessarily mean a specific unit it just means that in real life it is a hundred times bigger than on the house plan. So if I measure one centimeter on the house plan it would be hundred centimeters in real life. If I measure one millimeter on the house plan, that would be a hundred millimeters in real life. So let's make a note here at the bottom just to remind you that a scale is not unit, unit dependent. It merely tells us how many times bigger the real life house is than the house plan or how much smaller the house plan is than the real life house. Let's consider some seating plans. So here we can see there's a stage in front and every block in this diagram indicates uh, a seat and they are all numbered and they all have a row um, letter as well. So row A seat 1, row B seat 4. But if you look closely you will also see that there are different colors to this. Now depending on where you sit um, in the hall for example if it's like a theater hall um, you will have a better view so looking at this would you consider there's a better view from the purple seats or from these blue turquoise seats because the purple seats are quite far back and they're also here on the ends of each row I would think that the purple seats don't have a particularly good view so when they advertise ticket sales for this theater production or whatever this hall is used for I would suspect that the purple seats will be a little bit cheaper than the blue seats. Just note here that even these seats here at the back, um, or at the back, they're in the middle, which means that you will have a better view of the stage. Therefore, they will not be purple, but they will be this blue, bluey turquoise color. Um, sometimes on these seating plants, they also indicate wheelchair seats. So over here, if I I will suspect that these little round seats here are most likely different to the rest of them. So here's a round one here at the back. There's also some round ones. And you can see that they are easy access accessible. So it's very easy to get to them. You don't have to pass other people to get to that seat. So those are most likely wheelchair friendly seats. Before we go on to the rest of the map work, we just quickly need to check our northeast southwest directions. You might remember this from geography if you've taken geography, if you still take geography, if you've taken geography in previous grades. So, if there are no directions given on a map, we always consider that north is at the top. Um, your teachers might have told you the, the rhyme of never eat sour worms. Although I love sour worms. Um, so that stands for north, east, south, west. You can consider north and south as the slightly more important directions because they will always be mentioned first if we refer to directions between south and east or for example north and east. What I mean by this is you will say this direction over here is northeast. Don't say east-north, it's northeast. The north always comes first. And equally here, it's southeast. The south always comes first. If it is 
east of southeast, you can say east southeast. And if it's south of southeast, you can say south southeast. In general, we just wor work with the four major and the four secondary directions. So make sure that you can give directions, um, these different directions. Um, you might also sometimes find a map with grid references on them. Um, so a grid reference is horizontal reference and vertical references. So over here, the name of this block would be A for going this way, 1 for going down. A1, here we have A2. It's similar to a seating plan where you have a row number and a seat number. So here we have a row number and a block number. If I tell you that the botanical garden is at A on this, the small green A on this map, then you will see that it is right over here in Van Riebeek Street. So the grid reference for this would be C3. So we can write that down for ourselves. The grid reference for botanical garden is C3. On a street map like this, we can also ask you to give directions. So if I would like to go from Rhenish Girls High to the Botanical Gardens, how would I do this? So firstly, it's always nice to find a route for yourself and mark this in on your map if possible. Following the roads. So you can either go down Dorp Street or you can go down Plain Street. And now you will have to write these directions down. So starting from Rhenish, starting at Rhenish, um, Rhenish is a girls only English school in Stalamash. Um, just <laughs> for a little side note, you will take Frieda Street and you can also say in the direction in a, remember your northeast, southwest over here. So I will say that is a northeasterly direction. Um, at the first intersection, an intersection means at the first stop where the roads cross, you will have to take a left onto Petrotev. It is always good to give as much information as possible. So you want to refer to street names, you want to refer to directions. You can also mention that you will be passing Paul Roos, um Gymnasium here. Um, just give as many directions as possible. This also helps if you're just phoning someone up and um, giving them directions to get to your house or if you um, ask a friend how to get to their house. Always good to give, always good to give as much information as possible. So following Petrative Street, you are going to go past Dorp Street. Um, so always good to say what roads you are passing. Because even if the person passes the door, they don't know that they are on the right track um, and they haven't accidentally made a mistake. So it's almost like a little check, check in to know that they are passing the correct street. And then they will, at the second traffic circle, you will note that these dots here are traffic circles. So at the second traffic circle, uh, you will have to turn right at that plane, uh, at that circle, onto Plain Street. After Plain Street, you are going to uh, pass Rainefeld or Andringa Street, Rainefeld Street, and just before Netling Street, the Botanical Garden will be on your left. So make sure to write down all those street names in explaining where it is. Also mention if the Botanical Garden is on your left or right. If you look closely here there's a cross so that is most likely a church. You can also say that the botanical gardens are next to a church. This is a normal map and here we have a map of the Western Cape. So normally the major routes are indicated on a map like this, on a road map. So here it is indicated as 
N1 and you will know that that is one of our national roads. That's what the N stands for. Over here we have the N2, the N12 and the N9. So normally with questions like this, we ask you things like um, scale. So what I've done here is I'm going to try and do this electronically, but you will have to do it with your ruler um, in an exam. So if I want to know what the distance is between Cape Town and Worcester, I can measure this distance of four centimeters. Now, obviously, the distance between these two towns is not four centimeters, and I will have to use the scale of this map. Now, here at the bottom, we have a bar scale and not a number scale like we worked with with a house plan. So what you can do is, once again, with your ruler, measure um, a section of the bar scale. So here I'm measuring that five centimeters equals 120 kilometers according to the bar scale here at the bottom. So we can just point that out. Five centimeters is the same than 120 and we can see that that is kilometers. If you have now measured that the distance between Cape Town and Vista is four centimeters, then you put it under the centimeter section because this is ruler and this is real life. So we are going to do a ratio calculation here. And if you remember from how we did ratios, we would say divide up times down. You can also think about it this way. If, four cent if five centimeters represent 120 kilometers, it means that one centimeter will represent 24 kilometers. And therefore, four centimeters will equal 96 kilometers. So there are definitely different ways that you can work out this ratio calculation. The concept that you have to understand here is that if 5 centimeters represent 120 kilometers, then what does 4 centimeters represent? So it really is a ratio in which we compare the centimeters on the map to the kilometers in real life. We also get elevation maps. Now the word elevation should remind you of the word elevator, which really just means up and down. So here on this route map of the, the Merrill Whale of Trail, um, it's definitely a trail run, a 35 kilometer trail run. We can see that the first section has an uphill, then it has a downhill. So this is almost like a graph that they are showing here at the bottom. Um, so there's different information. They tell us the distance here in kilometers. They tell us the altitude in meters above sea level. And in this case, they even accompany it with the map over here. If you understand maps and maybe you take geography, you will know that all these little contour lines here indicate that this is quite a steep section. Um, and this steepness here is decreasing once we get to Cupido's Crawl over here. And then here along the coast, it's obviously fairly flat. And we can also see this on the elevation map here at the bottom. So in an elevation map, we would often say at what elevation or altitude does this road, this is, um, race start. So we can read here that it's just under 225. So we can estimate that it starts at about 200 meters above sea level. The highest point is about 600 meters above sea level and it seems like our lowest point is above zero but it's fairly low so we can estimate that this is about a third of the section which is about 25 meters above sea level also when we ask elevation maps um, it's always nice to bring in speed distance and time especially seeing that this is a trail run or a running race and here at the bottom some information has been given for you for the eight kilometer section between checkpoint two and checkpoint three. So if someone runs this section in 45 minutes, what was their speed in kilometers per hour? Using my speed distance time triangle, I, if I have to calculate the speed, I will have to say the distance of eight kilometers over the time of 45 minutes. 
remembering that 45 minutes is three quarters of an hour, you can write it as eight kilometers over three quarters of an hour or 0 0.75 hours. Remember that if I want a speed of kilometers per hour, I will need to divide kilometers by hours, which gives me 10.67 kilometers per hour. If you have a Casio calculator or a natural display one with the degrees, minutes and seconds button, you can also use your calculator for this and you type in zero hours and 45 minutes and this will give you the same answer. Remember that you cannot say 8 divided by 45 because that will give you an answer of kilometers per minute and speed is expressed as kilometers per hour. The last type of map that you might get is that of a strip map. So it means that it is just the distances between places that are indicated. If you've ever traveled between Cape Town and Port Elizabeth, you know that this road is not absolutely straight like it's indicated here. But in this strip over here, um, the major towns on the N2 is indicated for you on the route between Cape Town and Port Elizabeth. On the side here, the kilometers is indicated. So if I'm at Cape Town, I'm at zero kilometers. At Somerset West, I've traveled 45 kilometers and so forth and so forth. And I can see that Port Elizabeth is 779 kilometers away from Cape Town. On the other side, the reverse is indicated from Port Elizabeth 0 to Cape Town 779. We can use this map to read distances. So it's almost like a chart that's given here, more than a map with different routes on them and directions. This map is definitely not used for directions, but more just to read um, number values of the kilometer distance between places. If I would like to know the distance between Cape Town and George, I would start at Cape Town and go up to George and I will see that this is 458 kilometers. So I really like to highlight when I have a test or exam. Um, it helps me to know what I'm reading off my chart. So 458 kilometers. Now we want to know the distance between Cape Town and Neisner. So once again, I'm starting at Cape Town here at the bottom and I'm going to Neisner and that is 520. Always remember to add your units to your answer here. Now that I know the distance between uh, Cape Town and George and Cape Town and Neisner, I can also calculate the distance between Neisner and George. So all the way to Neisner is 527 kilometers and to George is 458 kilometers, which means the difference between them, difference being minus, will give us the distance between uh, George and Neisner, which is 69 kilometers. The other thing that is indicated on this map are roads that are or places that are just slightly off the N2. So here, for example, we can see that Hermanus is 35 kilometers away from the N2 and that Hansby is a further 55 kilometers away from the N2. So if you've ever driven on the N2 and then go, gone to Hermanus, you will know that there's um, the slipway that takes you off the N2 and that the N2 doesn't actually go straight to Hermanus. So here in our last question, I'm asking, what is the distance between Cape Town and Stillby? So finding this on my map, I will see that Stillby is located over here and there's a 27 over there. So we will need to find out what the distance is to the closest spot, which is 304 kilometers. So 304 kilometers um, to that dot. And that dot is really indicated there that this is the closest place from where you can reach Stillby on the N2. And then we will have to add on the 27 kilometers that you will have to travel on that road that is a slipway from the N2. And together this gives us 300 
and 31 kilometers. So to travel from Cape Town to Stilbar is 331. And that is maps all wrapped up in a nutshell.